Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings transcribed to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for Hire. Pat Novak for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you always bite off more than you can chew. It's tough on your windpipe, but you don't go hungry. And down here, a lot of people figure it's better to be a fat guy in a graveyard than a thin guy in a stew. That way, you can be sure of a tight fit. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else that makes a sound like money. It works out all right. If your mother doesn't mind you coming home for Easter in a box... I found that out Wednesday night, about 9 o'clock. I closed the shop early, and I came home to read. It wasn't a bad book, if you ever wanted to start a forest fire. It was one of those historical things, and the girl in it wandered around like a meat grinder in ribbons. I was moving along all right. She was just getting her second wind before going after the world's record when the door to my apartment opened, and the place began to get kind of crowded. From where I sat, the crowd looked good. She sauntered in, moving slowly from side to side, like 118 pounds of warm smoke. Her voice was all right, too. It reminded you of a furnace full of marshmallows. Good evening. Yeah, thanks for knocking. I don't think you mind my coming in without warning. No, I get the cabbage smell from next door the same way. Does it pay to be that polite, Mr. Novak? Saves you the trouble of saying please. What's on your mind? That bottle in front of you. Will you pour me a drink? No, I won't. You'll save dough if you look up a bartender. All right. I came to use you instead of your whiskey anyway. Let's hear. My name is Lee Inderwood. I'll give you $300 to do something for me. It'll only take an hour. That's too much dough unless it's murder, and if it is murder, it's not enough dough. Are you afraid? I just don't like paid murder. I told you, when you get caught, the pain gets expensive. If it were murder, I'd do it myself. Mr. Novak, I want you to frighten someone for me. Why don't you hire a friend? Are they too pretty? It's a man named Dixie Gillian. You'll find him in an office down on Folsom Street at this address. I promise nothing will happen to you. That's what they told Benedict Arnold. He'll be in this office until 11 tonight. I want you to go in and see him. Tell him you're from Adrian, and that he's to get out of town by tomorrow noon. Suppose he wants to put it off. He won't. Don't let him know who hired you. Just tell him Adrian said to leave. Look, lady, you better go on home. For 300 bucks, I won't buy a tissue paper plot. Now tell me more or say goodbye. There's not much more I can tell you, except there won't be any trouble. He's a rotten little beast, and I want him frightened badly. Why? He's been bothering my sister. Why doesn't he bother you? Because I bother back too fast. Do you want the 300, Mr. Novak? It's going to be a long summer. Put it on the table. Good. And you'll need this, too. No, you keep that. I don't want a gun. It's empty. Don't worry. See? No shells. It's perfectly safe. Now, look, sis, I got a nasty disposition. You can rent that for 300 bucks, but if you want more, find a gunsel. I don't want you to be a gunsel. That's why I want you to use this gun. I know it's empty. Use it on Dixie and he'll scare fast. It's just a way to save some breath. All right. It's your 300. You'd better go now. Yeah. Wait till I get a coat, will you? If your doorbell rings, don't play mouse. Oh? Because I may look you up. Am I too young to ask why? Because if anything goes wrong, I'll be around looking for you. And from there on, it won't be nice. I'll dirty you up like a locker room towel. Relax, Patsy. You'll never learn to fall in love that way. <laughs> She handed me the gun and walked out of my apartment. Seeing her leave made you feel like Frank Buck losing an argument. She walked with a nice, easy swing of a satisfied leopard. And for a small leopard, she had pretty good spots, too. Well, I put the gun in my overcoat pocket and I went down to Folsom Street. The address was down near the bridge entrance and the street was deserted except for a couple of winos near the corner. 
trying to buy back 1926 at a dollar a jug. I stopped in front of the place. It was a machinery company, and I could see a light burning in the back. I began to walk through the place. It was so quiet you could hear a worm with whooping cough, and there were enough shadows around to keep a ghost happy for years. When I got to the office back in the corner, through the glass, I could see a man sitting at the desk. When I opened the door and walked in, he didn't seem surprised. Come on in, mister. You're bad on noise. Yeah? That's right. You make too much for a thief and not enough for a customer. What do you want? About ten words, if you're Dixie Gillian. Go ahead. You better look up a timetable. What makes you that tough? This. Oh. Well, you look tougher with a gun. Does it make you talk faster? Now, look, I'm going to say it's slow, mister. Pack up your rompers and get out. Is that you talking or somebody else? I'm just the guy with the gun. Adrian does the talking. And he says get out. That's right. You got the whole message now. All right, you told me, so wander out and spend your dough. I will. Oh, you'll need part of it, though. Because I'm going to give you an answer for Adrian. I'm going to take that gun away from you, mister. You can pick the pieces out of your head on the way home. You better stand back or I'll share it with you. You've got your offer, mister. Let's see you make good. I'll save your muscle, fella. Stop that gun! Save your muscle, fella. The gun's empty. (laughs) Somebody fool us, mister. Sometimes you can get a home run with a half swing. That's the way it was this time. He couldn't have made it with a prayer book in both hands. He slid down to the floor and trembled for a minute and then flattened out like a leaf in a pool of water. Just before he died, he grabbed his side as if he didn't like the way it hurt. And then he didn't care. I rolled him on his back and let him look at the ceiling. His eyes were open and he looked surprised like a guy who didn't figure on a change in the weather. There was a scar that ran across his forehead and dug deep into his hairline. And he was lying there with a bunch of pink gum showing as if he was trying to pick up a few bucks with a toothpaste ad. Well, I didn't have time to tell him how sorry I was because if homicide caught me here, I'd have about as much chance as a canary in a basement full of cats. I started for the door, but right then I knew I could start ordering birdseed. It was Hellman, and he walked over to look at the body. Hello, Novak. The guy looks embarrassed. Yeah, I guess he is, Hellman. What's he doing dead? Putting in a beef somewhere, I guess. He rates it. He'll like you for that, Novak. How'd it happen? A team play. We worked it out together. But you've got the gun. That's right. I got the gun. Yeah. You feel like a bet? No, just keep stealing the old way. You know how I feel, Novak? You feel flabby to anybody else, but to yourself, I suppose you feel good. Look, I walked in here with a gun. There was some quick fight talk, and I killed him, but it's still not a good rap. I can get a long price on it for you, Novak. I'll bet you can, Hellman. You can give me a bad deal, but part of the time it'll be from the other side of the deck. Worse than that, Novak, it'll be all the time. And I want to watch you because I think you're going to be a crybaby. I'm going to scream if that's what you mean, Hellman. I'm going to scream about a gal that sent me in here with an empty gun. That's a big hole for a cap pistol, Novak. I got a last-minute curve. It was empty once. Yeah, that's the only way they make a gun. I don't want you for an hour ago. I want you for this dead guy on the floor. All right, all right. I told you I didn't come in here to kill the guy. I don't know him. He may even be a good guy. I'm sorry he's dead. All right, Novak. Just wait a few weeks. You can tell him personally. Hellman had me up against the rail and he knew it. When we left there, he was wearing a big, toothy smile. It was big enough to sew on his ears. He called the coroner and told him to pick up the stiff, and then we rode downtown. He dropped the gun into ballistics and hauled me into his office. The reporters were there. He gave them the whole story and told them how to spell Hellman. After that, we wound up at the desk, and he booked me on suspicion of murder. The next hour and a half was the kind of stuff they don't write about in the paper. They call it interrogation, and when you're finished, you've been through a lot of tight spots, like an atom up at Caltech. About 11 o'clock, Hellman brought me into his office, and from there on, it happened kind of fast. I just talked to the DA. He's going to streamline things for you. Well, he's going to look funny going to trial on a guy you can't identify. We'll find out all about the dead guy. You can't count his fingers without making a mistake. If you want to know who he is, talk to that girl. Her name's Lee Inderwood. We've been through all that, Novak. Now, suppose you tell me who Dixie Gillian is. I don't know, Hellman. The girl said his name was Dixie Gillian. I won't press you. I don't have to, Novak. 
I've got the only parlay I need. You, the dead guy, and a big fat murder gun. Uh, sure. Yeah, Hellman talking. Yeah, I know it was a 38. They're crazy down in ballistics. I saw them standing over the dead guy. They must have made a mistake, that's all. No, no, I don't want him in here. I don't want him in here. Hey, Tony. Tony, I... Ah. You're getting pale. You need some more rouge, Hellman. I got some bad news, Inspector. Well, keep it or you'll take more home to your wife. I'll talk to you later. No, talk to him now, Hellman. If that bullet doesn't match the gun, talk to him now. That's right, Inspector. A thirty-eight bullet, but it won't match the gun you brought in. It's got to match. I came in and found him standing there. He's already admitted it. It's a neat trick, then. If he fired the bullet out of that gun, he retooled it in midair. I'm not that fast, Hellman. Come on, get out of that chair so you'll have room to squirm. You keep still, Novak. I won't bother you. I'm going home. Huh? I'm walking out of your jail, Hellman. You got a broken down 38 that won't fit anything but your thumbs. You can't hold me on that. I found you over the body. I can hold you on suspicion of murder. Yeah, but it'll hurt tomorrow morning, Hellman. The papers will be down for a follow-up, and you'll have to tell them what it looks like out in left field. I'll handle them. You can't afford to let them start laughing at you. People get the idea it's your face. You can save car fare if you stay right here, because I'll have you back by noon tomorrow. You're not that good, Hellman. You couldn't hold a moth with a searchlight. The town ought to thank you. What? Oh, it's a nice jail, Hellman. With you around, it'll last for years. When I walked out of headquarters, I had a nice mess to juggle. It was like trying to walk the baby on a floor full of marbles. If things didn't add up for Hellman, they weren't going to do any better for me. I knew that gun I had went off. If it did, what happened to the bullet and where did the other one come from? And why weren't there two shots? Well, I couldn't put my finger on a thing, and nothing added up. It was like trying to follow a grain of rice in a Shanghai suburb. So I looked up Lee Inderwood's address, and I went by her apartment. A girl downstairs told me that she worked at a nightclub out on the Bay Shore Highway. Well, I had to hit a couple of places, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. A good man, until he began to figure the last drink in the bottle is just as easy to get at as the first. I found him in a little leather-trimmed sink on Powell Street. It was a grimy little hole where they washed the glasses once a week in stale beer. But Jocko was more at home than a vulture in Calcutta. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to celebrate my return to health. Something mild for Mr. Novak, a double stinger, perhaps. No, forget it, Jocko. i got to talk to you. Patsy, I've just passed through a crisis. A few minutes ago, they set before me a glass with a woman's lipstick all around the rim. All right, Jocko. I took one gulp and looked at the glass, and in this dim light, I thought I was bleeding to death. It took them ten minutes and three mirrors to calm me down. Jocko, I'm in trouble. You've got to help me. But they washed the glass for me in ammonia. They must have left a little ammonia in the glass because the next drink had a very odd tang about it. I've had three more just like it, a, a sort of ammonia collins. All right, all right. So far, they've been using domestic ammonia. When the imported stuff comes in, I may give up whiskey altogether. Calm down, will you, Jocko? i got a bum shake tonight. Yes? I either killed a guy or thought I did. That uses up the alternatives. Uh, what are you doing now, taking a vote? I got hired to scare a guy down on Folsom Street. Ten minutes later, the guy was dead. Patsy, you take your work too seriously. Couldn't you have just scared him into a lingering illness instead of killing him? One of the props was an empty gun. Only when the fight came, it grew bullets. Hellman walked in right after on a telephone tip. What are you doing out of the gas chamber? The whole thing backfired down at headquarters. The bullet and the phony gun wouldn't match. Oh, it doesn't add up, Jocko. That call to Hellman's a tip-off. I was framed, but why wasn't I framed all the way? Who is the dead man? Oh, just a guy with a falling blood count. His name was supposed to be Dixie Gillian, but there's no identification and no record on him. You shouldn't have hired out as a gunsel. I told you I didn't hire out as a gunsel. It was somebody else's idea. You have no conscience, Patsy. It's just a sort of soap opera rule of thumb you put into practice now and then, but no real conscience. You'd let a dying woman lie in the middle of the highway unless her head was resting on a pile of savings bonds. All right, Jocko, I'll cry with you later. I need help now. What sort of help? I want you to break into a girl's apartment. Yes? Don't worry, she won't be home. Ah, is that supposed to be an incentive? It's at this address here, up on O'Farrell. Her name is Lee Enderwood. She's the one who hired me. If the girl's not there, what am I supposed to find? Anything that'll connect her with a dead man. He's a big guy with a scar. That doesn't help much. You can't miss. Go through the desk and drawers. Pick up everything you can, will you? And leave a message at my place. As soon as I finish this drink. Oh, hurry up, will you, Jocko? Leave the glass alone and get going. Don't 
rush me. Hurry up, will you? The glass is empty anyway. Yes, that's what you thought about that gun, but the fellow got an awful jolt out of it. Good night, lover. I went by a horse parlor on O'Farrell Street and borrowed a car from a guy. It was after midnight when I started down the Bayshore Highway, and about a half hour later, I pulled up in front of the Cat's Paw. It was a long, rambling place on the left side of the road. There was no plan. It just followed the erosion line until they ran out of material. There was enough neon in front to light a main intersection in heaven. In the lobby, I saw a picture of Lee Inderwood, one of those shadowy things that was supposed to make you think she'd die in a cold climate. She was sitting at a piano with a little microphone in front of her, and you got the idea right away. She didn't have much of a voice, but plenty of songs that made your wife lean over and ask you to explain. I asked a 50-year-old busboy, and he said she was back in her dressing room getting ready for the 1 o'clock show. When I walked in, she was sitting in front of a mirror working on an upswept hairdo. If she swept it up anymore, it was going to leave her head. I stood behind her, looking at the pink, fresh part of her neck that didn't show when the hair was down. You seem fascinated, Patsy. No, I just want to know where to break it. Oh. Sit down on the footstool next to me. That's it. I like to look down on people. Mm. Let me brush that strand of hair back. Or do you like it in your eyes? Now, brush it back so I can see your answers. Who's Dixie Gillian? What difference does it make? None to him and some to me. He's dead. No, he couldn't be dead. Yeah, well, he'd like to believe that, too. I couldn't sell him that story about an empty gun. He couldn't have been killed with that gun. No? No. I put in a blank, Patsy. Somebody used a hard-working bullet because Dixie's dead. There was no reason to kill him. I don't understand. Yeah, well, that makes you even with homicide. But they got a bigger team. Now, look, I made a diagram, Angel. Up at my place, I ran over murder with you. I don't like it. If you kill people, you don't get invited out enough. So if it's you or me on this one, I'm going to push you all away. Don't understand it, Patsy. Who's Dixie Gillian? He was after some microfilm. I thought I could scare him away. You better be ready to identify him because homicide stopped. Even that scar didn't help. What scar, Patsy? The scar across his face. There's no record on him. Oh, no, no, Patsy. Everything goes wrong. Everything you touch goes wrong. That's the wrong man, Patsy. Yeah. Well, it's too late for a recount. You've got to get to that body, Patsy. I don't know how, but some way you've got to get to him. You look good, Lee. You make a nice picture. Wait a minute, Dixie. You don't need your coat. Come on. I don't know how it happened, Dixie. I didn't mean it that way. If you like it that way, all right. Bring your boyfriend, too. No, don't let him, Patsy. The gun's too big. I'm going with him. It was a short trip. He led us out of the dressing room and down a thin hall to the back door. On the way past the kitchen, you could smell onions and used grease, and that's about all you noticed except the sound of a jukebox somewhere out in front and somebody laughing in a loud, mirthless way. When we got to the door, it was raining outside. We walked about 40 feet over near some trees where the dark was working overtime, and the gunsel made her stop. Pick your spot, Lee. You can't be that crazy, Dixie. She's going to get wet, mister. You'll have a little trouble yourself. <laughs> when I woke up, it was still raining was lying on top of the mud like a stubborn seed. My wallet was gone, and the gunsel had ripped open my pockets. I stood up and walked over for a last look at Lee. The rain had washed the makeup off her face, and she looked small and tired as she lay there, like a broken doll that had been tossed out in the rain. I guess she was. Well, I got to my car, and I drove back to town. I checked my place, but there was no word from Jocko, so I went up to Lee's apartment. When I opened the door, the room was dark, but I knew somebody was on the rug. Either that or they'd varnished the floor with bourbon. I flipped on the light and bent over Jocko. Hey, hey, hey. Wake up, Jocko. All right, Jocko. Come on, wake up. 
Come on. A little ammonia. A little ammonia, I think, would bring me around. What happened? I was uh, sapped, I guess. Uh, everybody's got the same act tonight. Uh, help me up. Come on. Uh, Where have you been? I went down to meet the girl. Where'd you meet her? In a swimming pool? I've been in the rain all night. She's going to stay longer. What'd you find out? The fellow with the scar is her husband. Yeah? There's a picture in the desk. Are there any more pictures? A few. Take a look. Okay. Where, in here? Yes. Well, well. Who's he? It must be Dixie Gillian. He was down to pay off a debt tonight. She called him Dixie once. There's a note with that name and an address in the other drawer. He's our boy. We better get up there. Not if he's already killed two other people. We can't wait for Hellman. If he gets away, I'm all through. I won't have a leg to stand on. That's my point. When the other fellow gets through with us, we won't have much standing to do. I felt better now. Gillian was the only guy left in the picture, so I dragged Jocko up to his place. It was an apartment up on Post Street. The elevator operator took us up to the eighth floor and said that Gillian had come in a few minutes before. There was no answer, so we tried the door and it was open. Jocko didn't like the idea. Patsy, this is folly. Risking my life is one of the bravest things you do. Keep still, Jocko. What are we supposed to do? The door was open, wasn't it? Saw a lot of graves, but I've never been tempted. Hey, look at the furniture. There's been a fight in here. I'll look in here. You check in the bedroom, huh? Well, if I'm not right back, don't expect me at all. All right. Patsy. Yeah. Patsy, come here. All right. There's somebody on the fire escape. Come here. Stand back here. Oh, he's not moving. He was leaning that way when I first saw him. All right. I'll get on this side. You raise the window. Now, go easy, Jocko. Can you see him from there? Raise it a little more. All right. He's still leaning there. I can reach out. All right. Watch yourself. If he's kidding, you'll lose an arm. I've got it good. Raise the window more. Take the... Patsy, he's falling. Give me a hand. Oh, here, let me through there. Oh, it's too late. I can't hold it. Hang on, Jocko. He's falling. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, he was probably dead anyway. If he wasn't, that was a step in the right direction. Well, it was an easy night to die. Three of them had checked out already, and there was still time to look for more. Jocko and I went downstairs to see the guy. He was lying face down in the alley, and as you looked at him, you got the funny feeling he belonged there. He didn't disturb the scene. He just fitted in like a dirty, wet newspaper under a grandstand. There was a gun in his pocket, probably the same one that killed the girl, but there was no way of knowing. Jocko and I watched him for a minute, but your eyes begin to hurt when you see your only warm lead in a deep freeze. It was past two when I got down to headquarters and looked up Hellman. I briefed him on the girl and the guy in the alley, and then I asked him if any microfilm had turned up on the first guy in the morgue. That was a waste of time. Hellman couldn't find a brass ring in a dead man's nose, but we went over to the morgue for another look. So far, it was working out like a crossword puzzle torn in half. It's your time, Novak. I got more after tomorrow. You haven't. The microfilm must be on the guy. Three people have been killed for it, and I got roughed up just for laughs. We searched the guy once. Uh, here it is. All right. Help me roll it out. Yeah. Well, well. He sure got thin under that sheet, didn't he? Wait a minute. Oh, you run a good morgue, Hellman. What'll the paper say when they hear the stiff got up and walked out? They got him in the wrong place or something. He didn't walk out. Well, he's gone, Hellman. You got an answer? He's been moved, I tell you. The guy was dead, and I saw him put in here. Couldn't be walking around with a hole in the middle of his back. I don't know, Hellman. You do it with one in your head. Don't sell the guy short. When Hellman found out the body was gone, he stood there and stared at the empty slab. And then he started looking around in a nervous way, like a man trying to find the sugar bowl at a restaurant counter. A few minutes later, he turned and walked out of the morgue, and we were halfway downtown when it happened. It must have hit us at the same time, sharp and quick, like a piece of candy and a bad tooth. The guy back in the alley had come off that slab in the morgue. We got out to Dixie's place, and we began to check. There was a phone operator downstairs, and she said that Dixie had put through a call about two hours ago. Hellman checked the number, and it was the ticket office of a railroad. 
We got downtown and ran through the timetable. There was a train leaving the Oakland Mole in about 40 minutes. Well, it was an outside chance, but tonight that was the only kind for sale. We got down in time to slide on the last ferry over to the Mole. It was still dark out when the ferry pulled away from the slip and started across the bay. But over toward the Berkeley Hills, it was beginning to get light. The sky was the color of a bruise spot on a man's arm. We'll get up to the pilot house and tell him not to dock until we've gone through all the passengers. He doesn't have to be on this one. We'll check the train when we get there. Wait a minute. You don't have to check. There's your boy. Where? Up there on the rail, see? Now, you better go easy, Hellman. He's not a scale model. Yeah. Just walk quietly until we're behind him. All right. Turn around, Uh, mister. You'll get a better view. Hello, Novak. How was the wind and the rain in your hair? Meet Inspector Hellman. You better turn in your ticket. I hope you brought your muscle. Grab him, Hellman. That's what I'm trying to do. All right, copper. Watch it. I'm being pushed over on the rail. I'm worried, Hellman. Watch it, Novak. I'm going over. That's one down, mister. Now for you. I landed on the deck and watched him disappear into the dark. Halfway down, the guy turned in. I got up and followed him down the ladder and along the main deck. He ducked into one of the engine spaces, and I started in to look for him. It didn't take long because he turned out to be real helpful. You got the idea yet, Novak? I'll come closer. Tell me then. Do it yourself. But I'll knock you down hard when you show. Watch that platform. You're backing into trouble. Stay back there, Novak. Watch out for that platform, will you? You're backing into the engine. Ah! I kind of wound up last, huh? Yeah. That's the way it looks. Did you get the microfilm? Yeah. Uh, I got a big hurt. Does it show? A little. Yeah. It's been a long night, Novak. Huh? Yeah. But your worries are over. It's almost dawn. I don't know if I can use it, but I'll give it to you. Hellman out of an oil slick a few minutes later. It was the first time his hair ever looked good. Dixie Gillian lasted long enough to piece the story together for homicide. Lee Enderwood knew her husband was carrying microfilm, and she was worried, so she hired me to scare off Gillian. Oh, it might have worked, too, but the first slip came when Lee's husband went by to make a deal with Dixie without telling her. When I jumped him, Dixie was outside, and Figured it was a double cross, so he killed him with a silencer when that phony gun that Lee gave me went off. Dixie knew that the microfilm was still on the dead man. The only way he could be sure was to get the body out of the morgue. He took it up to his apartment, and when he got the film, he planted the gun and put the body on the fire escape. It was a little safer that way. There was a 50-50 chance the police would miss it the first time around, and he'd have a fair lead. Almost worked out for him, except for that phone call. The microfilm was in a capsule next to the roof of the guy's mouth. So old, it was new again. Well, Hellman asked only one question. In that fight, did I have anything to do with pushing him against the rail? I told him sometimes those ferry boats roll as much as 45 degrees. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the 10th of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William B. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. Be with us again next week. 
when over most of these same ABC stations will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.